Oh, welcome everybody. Uh, hey, yeah, all right. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Woo. Uh, we told him to do that. That was pretty awesome. <laughs> As you can tell, we've got a full house here at the acoustic shop. Yeah. And, uh, good reason. Uh, our good buddy David Harvey, the head of mandolin production at Gibson and master luthier. We've known David since we were little kids, and we'll talk a little bit about our history together. I mean, yeah, little kids. Jeremy's still little. I wasn't playing an instrument at the time, but well, I'm just not a kid. But <laughs> David knew me when I had hair. I did too. <laughs> well, we're very honored to have David here, and a very special night of kind of Gibson history and the mandolin evolution, all the way from one of the earliest Orville mandolins that is known. Which thank you, Greg Armstrong, for letting us have that in the shop here. Uh, it's kind of what inspired this evening. Uh, you guys, I hope everybody gets a chance to see this up close in person because it is a very rare and unique uh, instrument that you're not going to see anywhere else. So, uh, very cool. And then we're, Dave is going to help walk us through kind of the evolution of the mandolin from Orville's uh, very revolutionary design there through modern day Gibsons as he is the guy building them nowadays. Well, I have a very talented team. Shout out to, uh, to Brandon Mary and uh, Kevin. And we got a couple other folks that helped us out, but that's the, the crux of my team. Small but efficient team, like I always say. And uh, it's my honor to be here at the custom shop with y'all. And thank y'all for coming out tonight. Give yourselves a great day. Yes. Hey. Yeah. Appreciate y'all. And that, that just means all you people who stayed home and didn't come out here, shame on no. you. You can clap for yourself. <laughs> Nobody's going to hear it, though. <laughs> Go to the refrigerator and get yeah. another snack. <laughs> they don't have to wear pants, so that's, that's right. right. Who's the real winner tonight? <laughs> <laughs> well, we uh, we talked a little bit about these instruments before we went live tonight, and just a quick recap. What are you playing there? This was a very exciting moment for me in our careers, the Chapmans. I was approached by uh, Gibson about being an endorsed artist, and. This was, as a kid, like the most inspiring thing for me to actually be endorsed by Gibson mandolins. So I got to go to the uh, Nashville facility and pick out whichever mandolin I wanted, and I landed on the Sam Bush model, and this one in particular just spoke to me, and I've been playing it since uh, 20, 2003 is when I got it. So the uh, Sam Bush model Gibson. Very cool, very cool. And you deserve it, my oh. friend, very much so. Thank you. Um, and this is an advanced jumbo? Yeah, this is an advanced jumbo that belongs to uh, Gibson never thought that I was worth being an endorsed artist, so I just want to <laughs> point that out. Neither did Martin or Taylor <laughs> Neither did or Martin Collins or, or, or any or other brand, really. <laughs> Nobody really cared. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, this is David uh, David's guitar, personal guitar. We were discussing it beforehand. It is an absolutely beautiful advanced jumbo that has... Really pretty Brazilian rosewood on the back here and sides. Um, just is that uh, some, something really happened nice? in Nashville after I picked this mandolin out. Luckily, after I picked this mandolin out, um, there was a major flood down there, and the the mall is right up near the river, and it completely flooded. And Gibson, they had the the Gibson, I get what they call it, the showcase or the Gibson showcase. And they they actually built the mandolins there. You could walk through the mall and watch them building them. And a lot of wood and stuff got damaged in that flood. But David, you said this was kind of a flood salvage. It it's, saved, it's it survived. A survivor. It was actually um, it was in storage in a in a different location, and actually got near, but was not too affected by by the flood. Thank God, because it's such a beautiful guitar, and uh, um, I was um, very honored to uh, have a great facility director that. Um, I kind of uh, talked him in, in to let me adopt this guitar and because, you know, I might use it once in a while. So, uh, just a wonderful guitar and you make it sound great. So. Well, thank you. Uh, Can you talk to your facility manager about uh, letting me adopt a guitar? Are there too? any other guitars covered in dust that we could? Yeah, you can come in and, and kind of work nights. <laughs> <laughs> no, and when let, no, let's talk about that. When no security's there, you just walk out. Right. We'll, let, we'll talk about it. What do you got, that. David? So this is my master model from 2008, uh, faithful reproduction of a lower era F5. Uh, the spec came from uh, amalgamation of three very important mandolins, Ricky Skaggs's July 9 lore, which July 9 is a big a signing date for F5 mandolins from the lore period. Uh, Bill Monroe's mandolin was a July 9 mandolin. Um, this also uh, is amalgam with uh, Steve Martin, the great banjo player, comedian, renaissance guy. We used uh, a combination of his spec, Ricky Skaggs' spec, and, 
and then uh, the, of course the Gibson lore, July 9 lore. And you can actually see that mantlet on display at Common Station at the Gibson Garage. So go uh, next time you're in Nashville, go and check it out. There's some Orville Gibson stuff on display there and there are not too many places you can see uh, everything from Orville Gibson to Lloyd Lohr, right? So, and we have those here tonight yes. as well. Some Lloyd Lohr period stuff, along with, uh, of course, uh, Greg's Orville Gibson mandolin. So, we're going to pick one, and we I think we landed since we're talking about Bill Monroe and how he important he is to the mandolin. We'll do a little tune in honor of Bill that uh, his band wrote for him and called it Big Mon, and kind of a staple of bluegrass. So here we go. into uh, some history here and we're going to take a little step back in time if you would jo join me while we get in the time machine and we're going to run it back to about 1894. Uh, there's a fella in Kalamazoo he was working at a shoe store as a shoe clerk and he was amazingly this great luthier and he started building in the basement shop of uh, just below the shoe store and um, he actually built that mandolin right there. If you hand that one. Absolutely. Um, and we just determined. I'm plugged that, in. Determined today mm -hmm. that uh, we think that that's quite possibly one of the mandolins that's pictured on Orville Gibson's bench, and uh, the very famous picture of Orville's bench. And if it's not this particular mandolin, which he built one of a kind for the most part, so I don't think he made too many of the same anything. Uh, whether it be man on guitar or whatever it was, uh, he was pretty much uh, doing the same thing. Is it working now? Um, <laughs> I fixed it. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, we are the most professional music store in the business. <laughs> all right, go ahead. We're going to let you play so, your man. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't let him touch any others if I were you. <laughs> anyway, uh, 
I really do think that this is quite possibly the, the mandolin in the picture, and that's a very, very early picture of Orville Gibson's bench um, in the in that uh, little shoe store shop down below the shoe store in the basement, and it's very small, and uh, and this is a, a great example of an or Orville Gibson build. What are Orville Gibson's uh, biggest contribution to the world of instrument technology is that uh, somewhere along the line he decided he would implement violin technology and to mandolins and he was actually <coughs> excuse me he was actually in the, uh, the register registry in Kalamazoo Michigan as a violin maker first and then luthier uh, mandolin guitar builder later on but uh, his Wow, if mandolins and guitars were more like the violin, it'd be more present. And if you think about historically, the popular music of that time period were mandolin orchestras. And there were literally hundreds of mandolin orchestras across the United States. Uh, that was fueled by a group called the Spanish Students. Very ornate costumes and they mostly played banduras but mandolins were figured into that somewhere and uh, the musicians in the United States having readily available mandolins via Sears and Roebuck catalogs you get a mandolin for two dollars and fifty cents mm -hmm. you know and they were tater bugs so or bull back mandolins. Mike can you grab that one up on the shelf above your head? So yeah that's that's a great example can you grab of that? a really good tater buck mandolin. So <laughs> They sounded good, and they they were for uh, they were for orchestra music, you know, playing the classics. And that's not something that we're really going to do here tonight is play the mandolin orchestra tunes. But uh, back to what Orville Gibson did, he brought that technology to mandolins and built basically flat top and a carve or carved top with a flat back, and this is what is called a pan back, and you can see kind of similar to a frying pan from that period. This is quite different from this. <laughs> very much yeah. different. This was the see. Italian mandolin that uh, was very popular before, <coughs> really Orville, and, and some of the early mandolins were modeled more after a violin and using that arch top and getting rid of, I, it would be very, I've tried playing these bull backs, and it's pretty difficult to play. Well, for a guy my size, it's really <laughs> hard to play a tater buck mandolin. It's two, way out here. The two bellies don't really meet, meet up too well. Okay. Sumo wrestling. I have to look over this because there's no side dots on this mandolin. But the, uh, the construction and the build is phenomenal on this mandolin. If you look at the, uh, the quality of the workmanship, and if you look at the bridge carve, that's Orville Gibson's bridge carve. Uh, just phenomenal. I mean, you can see the influence of the, uh, of the violin world in his bridge carve. And then his Turkish pearl cutter uh, did the crescent moon and star. Uh, I don't know if that figured into uh, Orville's life particularly. I don't think so. I think he, he just knew a guy that cut pearl and he liked the crescent moon star and added that in, the, in his mandolins. Uh, something very different. His rims are sawn. They're not bent rims like a violin. So he took a great big piece of wood and he sawed out the rims. And then the heel of the neck is actually part of the rim. There's a slab piece of neck here and another slab cut here that finishes out the neck, but the neck is also hollow and there's a pass through between the, the body, the air chamber of the body, and the neck is actually hollow up to about the fifth fret on this mandolin. So the neck is actually part of the sound chamber, which is pretty innovative if, if you think about it. Not the greatest thing construction-wise in the long term, but uh, for a 120-year-old, 24-year-old mandolin, the neck is pretty straight on this mandolin, and it's, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. I took the original frets out of this mandolin and refretted it, um, and there was no fret left on it. But it, uh, the neck itself, the fingerboard chewed up very well, and that's a mahogany fingerboard, which is odd. Um, it's got a koa head veneer uh, that's laminated over the, over the walnut. It's walnut neck and back and sides with a cedar top. Now, th as the story goes, and you know about this story about, yeah. the, uh, about the walnut that Orville Gibson used. 
Yeah, it's. I think you were mentioning it to me, and I read it from somewhere else that he. One of the things he loved about where he was in Michigan was there's so many furniture builders. But he also found that they would use some of the scrap wood there. But then he found some church pews that he got a hold of, walnut church pews. And you believe this might be part of that walnut from those church pews? I, I believe that he built the, from the church pews for most of his rest of his career. Yeah. And so you see the early Orville Gibson stuff, and it's it's mostly furniture grade walnut, which is you know who knows how old it was when he actually built this mantle. And so really, that curve is not actually. It was it was people sitting on it. That curved out that, right? That's, that's what made this shape. <laughs> Somebody's rear end sitting on this at some point and going to sleep. During, yeah. the, during the Maybe a lot of squirming. <laughs> a lot of squirming. Yeah. You, work, you move around and for some of those Sunday sermons, you, you, you can reshape well, that. Do you think it, it cures it out and warms it up? A bit. <laughs> so. Maybe resonates every now and then. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's, you had to go I was. There. I wasn't going to do it. I wanted to, but I wasn't going to do that. Good for you, Jer. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy, for the uh, comedy part of the program. Yeah. But uh, you know, that's it, it's just amazing when you think about guys back then. They did what they needed to do. They got their their wood from wherever they could get it, and Orville very much so used whatever he had access to. And it seems like maybe this design helped with projection too, like you know, acoustically? Absolutely, because, you know, I can just imagine this, this mandolin coming out in the yeah. room. That is the standard. And I actually have this tuned to a, a whole step lower, which is That's pretty much pretty close to what they would have used back then, which is C-256 or A-432, instead of the standard of pitch now that is A-440, so it just gives it a very nice warm sound, and, um, Do I need to tune down? I kind of, uh, no, just use a capo, maybe, or, uh, or that little Martin guitar that you played before, if you can have some Can you get me that the Martin key? Out of, this yeah. Martin out of there? Because yeah. I do have that one tuned I'll down. grab that other. Yeah. So we're going to do a tune. I, I started working on this panel and I thought, well, you know, I wonder what the popular tune from 1898 was. And I did a little research and it was a tune called the Georgia Camp Meeting. And I heard a lot of different versions of that tune. It's a kind of a ragtime tune. And it was actually on piano rolls. And uh, I, I heard a uh, a good version from uh, Paul Yandel, who was who played with Chet Atkins most of his career, and I kind of amalgam all that together and came up with a, a little version I'll try to play here. And I kind of forgive me for having to look over, but nope. like I said, there's no side dots. Thank you very much, Jackson. Most mandolins have a side dot where you can actually see. Reference point. <laughs> so the, the the dots are kind of. A, Another thing I thought was interesting about this, it has a pretty strong radius on the fretboard. It's very much like a violin, except that the neck size is more like a cello. So it's uh, it's kind of big and clubby, but uh, it's got a really, very heavy radius. Uh, this mandolin was uh, and is in incredible condition for 124 years old. The one thing that I had to replace in the Tailpiece has been replaced. Everything uh, except for the the hardware, the tailpiece and the tuners are original. Uh, I bought these tuners from uh, eBay about 25 years ago. Didn't fit anything I had or I'd ever seen. And then I got this mandolin at home in the shop. Uh, the tuners were completely worn out, the originals, and I thought, well, maybe I have a set. And I pulled them out, and lo and behold, they fit. So I had to uh, carve them down a little bit to go around the volute, but they actually do say in Stay in pretty, pretty good tune for for 124 year old tenors or whatever. Else. But anyway, here's the. Uh, you mean you couldn't just go to the local shop and buy some? No, you can't get them for reproduction. Anybody that I know, so.
You had to talk about how good those were going to stay in well, tune. Well, you know, you? what happened there is I hit my finger on that first because the, the, the volute is so weird on this mandolin. There's no volute. So I was trying to get that and knocked into that tuner, but it does stay in pretty good tune. Other than that, so that was that was uh, operator error, <laughs> <laughs> and you saw it here first. So anyway, that tune sounds so like perfect for that mandolin. It, well, it yeah. is. I mean, and it's uh, a tune from 1898, just like the mandolin. So there you have the Orville Gibson mandolin. There you go, folks. And that isn't that a wonderful Very piece? Cool. And thank you, Greg. Yeah, for, Greg for, Armstrong. Thank yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> So, I would love for you to tell the story, if you don't mind. Um, I don't mind. I, I bought that in the early 60s, 1960s, uh, from a gentleman that was quite old at the time, about two, and a half about two and a half blocks from the original factory. And... Uh, I paid thirty-five dollars for it. Wow. <laughs> I offered him fifty, by the way. I'll give you yeah, he offered me fifty, but I turned him down. Uh, and that's really the whole story. I, my my mother and I were on a trip, buying antiques for an auction, and uh, I had an old Gibson J45 that needed a new top, and so I took it to the factory and they redid it for me. Still looking for that guitar, by the way. <laughs> if you're on the flat top uh, Gibson website or whatever. I put a uh, put a description of it. It's unusual, but anyway, that's uh, that's where I got it. And I've had it ever since. And, and the gentleman you bought it from said that he got it. He he says that he got it from Orville, and that he was a friend of Orville's. And right before Orville left uh, Kalamazoo for the east, for the sanitarium, I guess he was right. And uh, he had given this mandolin to the guy I bought it from. So I think I'm the second owner after Which makes me really honored to be the yeah. third yeah. <laughs> yeah good luck <laughs> actually i was i was saving it i figured i'd pay my kids college uh career or pay for their college fortunately i didn't have to 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 sell the mandolin for that but well it's it's quite a piece and thank it's, you again for bringing it in and let well thank you that. for fixing it for me because it's well. My, it's the first my, time I've ever heard it really played. Well, uh, in all uh, those except years. for the tuning issue I had there mm -hmm. with, with my finger. It sounds tremendous. And uh, I have a video of Ricky Skaggs playing it. I'll share it with you. Whoa, so, cool. Yeah, he, was, uh, he came over to the house the other night, and uh, I put that in his hand, and he immediately wrote a tune on it. And I said, what's that called? And he said, well, I don't know. I just wrote it. And I said, well, it sounds like the Orville Trot to me. So... <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll be sure. looking for that on Ricky's next album, by the yeah, way, the Orville Trot. So, <laughs> your, the Orville Mountain Breakdown. So this mandolin is an interesting mandolin. This is a, a post-production, this being pre-production. Production started in 1902 with the Gibson Mandolin and Guitar Company. was the mandolin first and then guitar. And this mandolin has um, the Orville Gibson layer label so it's got Orville Gibson's picture superimposed on a mando layer and if you can have a have a little look at that it's got the original label this is a 1906 and it's uh, post-production it has all the uh, all the modern elements of mandolin and this mandolin uh, and just amazingly just eight years after this mandolin was built this is basically what the A model uh, turned into it, it, it uh, you know, was a, a beautiful piece of engineering because they, I'm sure they were trying to figure out, well, how can we build a bunch of these? And the demands were pretty great. So uh, the, the story that I always heard about Orville Gibson, one of the mandolin orchestras approached him about building 100 mandolins uh, for their mandolin orchestras, with, which would be 100 piece or more mandolin orchestras. And Orville Gibson said, I'd be happy to, it will be $100 a piece and take 100 years. So, you know, you can see that he was building one, one piece at a time. So a group of investors heard about that story and decided to invest in Oral Gibson and his manufacturer ideas and, uh, and put, uh, put a lot of musk and horsepower behind his ideas. So by 1906, they had quite a lot of, uh, of luthiers working for the Gibson Company. And I think that those were immigrant violin and guitar builders from, 
France, Germany, Italy, places that uh, were a meccas of violin manufacturing and, and guitar manufacturing. So one of the people that, uh, that Orville worked with closely was a fellow named Ted McHugh, who was uh, head of R&D and was actually an Irish tenor singer and uh, Orville hired him for a gig and found out that he had a failing cabinet shop. So he stayed on. Orville, unfortunately, was kind of put out to pasture a bit. His ideas are a little bit archaic for mass production, as you can see. So Ted stayed on, and when the violin makers came into Gibson as, as luthiers, I think they looked at that design and thought, well, we don't have to saw the rims because there's a lot of waste there in materials. We can bend rims like violins. We can actually put linings in it because this mandolin has no blocks, linings, or braces. So by 19, really by 1904, uh, the manufacture techniques had developed into even more the step towards violin manufacturing. So this mandolin has kerfing, has a brace, has blocks, linings, and a dovetail joint. And that was, uh, what are all those? Those are cabinet makers' features, and that's Ted McHugh. Ted was uh, uh, instrumental in, in coming up with a lot of innovation and really making that, uh, that possibility for mandolins to be manufactured, and guitars for that matter, and everything that we built uh, to be manufactured in the numbers that would supply the, the demand because Orville's demand was, was very, very high. Immediately people figured out, wow, that's great. Those are great sounding instruments. And the demand rose really so quickly that by 1904, 1906, we were building 800 or more instruments a year mm -hmm. instead of 12 or 24 or whatever Orville, Orville was able to put out. So that's what this mandolin is. And you can see even that uh, it's the basically the lower line A model mandolin mandolin from that period still has the Gibson on the peg head and mother of pearl, hand cut mother of pearl and a fleur de lis with, with a mother of pearl uh, border around the fleur de lis and inlaid tortoiseoid into the top. I mean the amount of, of work is just phenomenal where it is very much like the Orville. I was going to say is next to each other the aesthetically looking at it, it's interesting how they took a lot of the feel of the way that neck or the body goes up to the neck and it they they improved on it with the being able to manufacture them with the violin stuff, but still, you can almost see this was modeled for that one. Very much so. It, the rosettes are very similar. Uh, this being single and this being double, it's still very it's rounded on that. Very that rounded. Hole. And uh, you know the 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 carve of the top is very much like Stainer violins instead of Guarneri and Stradivarian techniques. Stradivarian and Guarnerian techniques are, are a, a very gentle curve, and Stainer is very quick and very flat, and that's what you see there and here. And then, of course, they, they changed the back carve to more of like the top carve. So that's what you see there in this 1906 um, A model. So. Again, we're super blessed that actually came through the shop, too. So we've, we've been so lucky having these incredible vintage instruments come through. I don't even think you mentioned what that Martin was that you played on that last song. No. That, uh, by the way, for those people, I know there's probably people online right now uh, that are wondering about that. That is an 1897 style 17 Martin guitar uh, that we actually had come into the shop. Like Jeremy said, that Orville mandolin that David was just holding also came in by way of the shop. And then there was a long time ago, we also had a Lore uh, H5 that, uh, that you worked on. And that was our first kind of collaboration for, through the acoustic shop. So we've seen a few cool ones. Well, you, you guys have been very blessed, and that's a that's a good that's a good indication that that you're treating your clients right. No, we treat people poorly. That's uh, what well, we really do. That's we're, not what we're I all am. about. That. <laughs> well, and I'm so proud of our, our association because literally, I I worked with uh, with with Jeremy and John, and Jason, and the family to get them set up as a Gibson dealer. And I kept squeaking for many, many years about getting them on as a, as a Gibson dealer. And I'm, I'm very proud that uh, we not only got you in as a Gibson dealer, but I was able to deliver five mandolins. Five. And that's, that's, uh, a, that's, that's the most we've had at one time. So yeah. that was pretty awesome. That is the most I know of delivering on one <laughs> delivery. And uh, I only had to drive from Nashville to that's do all. it. See, that's what we do here. We have the actual head of production bring us our mandolins. <laughs> 
I we don't, don't do that for many people, <laughs> but I'm glad to do it for here. But we're very proud of that association, and uh, and it'll only get bigger as time goes on. And uh, we appreciate all the folks watching out there and and uh, the internet world and online. That uh, you know, if you if you've got needs, then uh, these guys will certainly help you out. And you know, uh, Gibson, uh, we we know that we're. Our attempt is to make dreams a reality for everybody. We want to build the, the instruments that are like these instruments. They're, they're investment quality and they will last uh, long after we're gone. So anyway, moving on, we've, uh, we've got two very important mandolins right here. This is um, the basically what the F4 was top of the line mandolin in, in uh, 1907. And this is one of the very last three-point mandolins. You can see this has got the third point, which uh, is, is no longer used since basically 1910. And you can see that uh, this gigantic picture right here, that's what we have in that yeah, picture. It's the the picard inlay. The three-point. And this, that might be this mandolin. You, never, you just never know. Uh, this mandolin <coughs> is very early. Uh, F model, and you can see that the carve is way more like Orville Gibson's carve, and with the inlaid pick guard still, with the wire and torch peg, and that's silver wire, and all hand cut pearl with the with the Waverly or the um, I'm sorry Handel tuners. Uh, that's a that was a German company that built tuners for Gibson, and that's all hand inlaid wire and, uh, and little pearl leaves, flowers, and uh, hearts, and stars, and all kinds of crazy little things that are like this big that uh, I can't even imagine how they, they would have done that in 1907. But uh, that, this is the F4. One piece, both one piece backs, top of the line, mahogany necks. The, uh, the differentiation here, this is a survivor mantle. This has not even been cleaned up. It's like the survivor cars that you see in a barn. The peg head scroll busted off, binding missing. This is this went back to the factory at some point and was refinished on top. It's had uh, a number of, of repairs like this mandolin as well. Uh, it had originally had the original uh, turnbuckle uh, clamps on the pit guard, elevated pit guard, which is uh, uh, like a violin chin rest clamp and it when it went back to the factory they took those off and the holes are still there on these little brackets but they installed the the later clamp which uh, that clamp is patented in 1911 i believe it is yep. and so it's a little early for that clamp they but they changed it over when it went to the factory and they refinished the top because this was not your your normal kind of a early sunburst color that is on this mandolin but uh, these are these are really great mandolins and we'll play you a little tune on these two <laughs> and this one's 1907 I did a little Google search and found a, a tune from 1907 G. Now let's hear that. How that compares to this? Very similar. Yes. Very similar. But now, if you look at the carve on this, this is much more the later carve on the scroll, which is much more updated and more like the the carve is now on the mandolins. This is being a very rounded and very much like the Orville carve. Oh, All right. So. They're old mandolins, folks, so. And he hasn't changed the strings either, so. <laughs> this is a little red wing.
So you're playing that this cool little notch they did right there next to your fingerboard extension. That little oh yeah, that uh, sharp. yeah, that's the. Uh, somebody asked me one time if we were copying somebody else. I said no, we've been doing that since about 1905. So it's a. It's, I, think, I think their saw slipped a little bit and they had to just take yeah, that out. Yeah, it's <laughs> just a, really sharp and dramatic on that. It is. I, I think that both of these possibly are replaced fingerboard. This one definitely is, and probably had this fancy fingerboard and went back to the factory. You know, back in the back in the day, if you sent it sent something back to the factory, it was easier to pull the whole fingerboard and replace it rather than refret it. So that's why you see so many mandolins, especially F5s, they were played a lot. They would have a replacement fingerboard, and I think that's probably what is here. But there is definitely a, a beautiful Victorian yeah. look of, uh, you know, the Gilded Age kind of overly ornate everything. And, and, uh, and God bless Gibson for that back yeah. then. So uh, we'll, we'll move on to uh, kind of a mandolin family here that we're, we're blessed to have in the house. Um, from 1914, 15, and 16. Are you just going to collect them on the floor over yep. there? I'm going to watch by step. <laughs> I'll substitute one of them up there. All right. I'm switching again. That's you, baby. Okay. All right. This is you. And I'm <coughs> this guy right here. You can. I guess I'm going to be a mandolin player now. Well, actually, <laughs> Mandola. Mandola. All right, so we'll go down the line here uh, in years and models. Uh, mandolin orchestras were, were like string orchestras. They were mandolin instruments basically playing violin, viola parts, and mandocello, cello parts. So that's what we have here. 
let's uh, you talk about the F4 right there that you've got. So this is, a, I think, a 1914 F4. This is part of the uh, Michael Savage uh, brought in some of his dad's mailings. When we first opened the shop, we were blessed to have uh, Michael Savage. His dad was a repairman for Gibson, so he had a lot of mailings that somehow when it was being repaired, it was better for the customer. They may have wanted a new one or something, but he acquired quite a few old ones, including this one, but he brought about 20 or 30 old Gibson mailings, including that H5 Lloyd Lore Mandola into the shop, and uh, we were able to find homes for most of those. This one we didn't find a home for, but he told me if I would start making payments on it, I could keep it. <laughs> and, Jeremy uh, found a home for it, in case you didn't know. I still Your need home. to make more payments on it. <laughs> $5 a week. Yep. He said, whatever you want to pay, so I'm, he regrets that now. <laughs> no, this is, uh, David also repaired this one for us. It did have a break in the neck on it, um, and then we sent it off to, to you, and you, you repaired it for us. A beautiful, that back on that, I was just stunned at the maple they were using even back in 1914, uh, the, the double flower pot on the, he the headstock. Um, David was able to find a piece of, this was missing the pick guard at the time because the, the plastic that you would use back then really oxidized and basically rotted away. Um, so it's hard to find some that are still in, intact. So I think you said this was from a mandola, it was a bigger piece, and you were able to cut away most of the rot and then make it look original on there. So Yeah, it's, it's crazy because people think, uh, well, you leave them in the case and they're safe there, but on the old instruments, the, the celluloid, which is what the pit guards were made out of, will off-gas, so it's better to get them out in the open and, and let the air case and the instrument air out once in a while because the, the, you'll see the, the off-gassing starts, and once that starts, it's, it's really difficult, and you usually have to take it off and throw it away. So, unfortunately. And no, that, when we'd and be in a even car off with John and he would off gas, we'd want to get him out of there too. <laughs> <laughs> Leave the doors open. That's twice, sorry. Jared. That's twice. That's two, yeah. <laughs> so this off gas, it, it, so distinctly uh, that it even basically took the, uh, rotted the top of the, the little cam clamp off there. You can see I kind of made that one work, but this is what that would, should have looked like. But, uh, um you may have to replace that eventually too. So figure that into the payment plan. I guess. <laughs> you know, it's, and it's funny when you talk about uh, the, the payment plan. Uh, Gibson was one of the very first instrument companies that uh, actually would let you pay five cents a day to own a Gibson instrument, and they they actually had ads in the uh, in, uh, Popular Science and Popular Mechanic magazines, and you could. You could get a free trial and get a Gibson sent to you, you and you just check a box, mandolin, mandola, mandocello, harp guitar. A harp guitar was, at that point in time, the most expensive instrument in the catalog, was about $375. This, this mandolin would have been right, with a case, would have been right at $200, about $7,000 in today's money in 1914. That mandola would have been slightly more, about two forty, two fifty with the case. The mandocello was almost three hundred dollars with the case. So they were expensive in instruments even back in those days. And um, uh, but you could, uh, they they modeled manufacture so much towards the Ford manufacturer. Uh, you know, I've often said, uh, basically what the what Gibson did is model. Uh, there are manufacturing techniques from a little automobile company up in Dearborn called Ford. And that's how we achieved that, uh, that big number of production, even in the, in the teens. And then they modeled after Ford as well to, to do uh, a pay-as-you-go, uh, five, cents, five cents a day. So that's a, a little more history for you, more than you probably wanted. But uh, I, hope that, uh, I hope you all are enjoying we some of this. That, that good of terms. Um, <laughs> you do get 14 days to try it out. We got paid for it first. <laughs> well, that's, that's not bad. That's not bad. But these are all in the same basic model, but just different, obviously different parts of the mandolin family, right? They're all the four series, and the four series was the top of the line at that point in time. And as you can see here, this is uh, these match. Um, the the K4 and the H4 Mandola, and I believe that's uh, this is late 15. That's early 16. I believe this to be from the same log. So you can see the the uh, the color. The uh, this one's been played a whole bunch more. That that Mandola is in incredible condition for its age. But uh, we'll play a little something on these three. Um, 
not a mandolin orchestra kind of a tune, but uh, check your rate. There you go. We recorded this a little bit ago. Stay tuned to some of the acoustic shop stuff and you'll see us do, uh, do that on one of those recordings. But, uh, this is a Ralph Stanley tune. I thought that'd be kind of cool on a mandocello. And uh, I actually wrote a tune on mandocello and you don't hear many guys say that nowadays, right? So, it's a little clinch mountain back step. Thank you much. Appreciate that. Y'all having a good time so far? Yeah. All right. Very good. Y'all was always worry about that we're I'm going to talk too much. Or... I always do. My wife says I do too. And she, I, I can say mandolin three times in a row. She goes into a coma now. <laughs> so. 
uh, she's very good about all this stuff. And my big uh, thanks to to Jan over here. She's Yay. she lets me uh, indulge all this mandolin nonsense, and I was, I keep telling her it's well, it's cheaper than a girlfriend or drugs or alcohol. So <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> If she's letting you take on any of those, I don't know what's going on right that there. That white face three, or the pumpkin top. Did you play that one? Or? Yeah. I knocked Which it out of the pumpkin one. Uh, the pumpkin top one. Well, Jeremy's going to get out uh, the A3, and I, I ended up with, I always loved A3s. At Christmas time, that uh, one of the music stores in Dayton, Ohio, was put their Gibson display out, and uh, I'd walk by, it was uh, Howard's Music um, in Dayton, Ohio, and I'd walk by from school. I'd actually take the long road home, it was like, like five miles out of the way, and I would just walk down there and, and stare through the window at all these great old Gibson mandolins. And I always loved the, uh, the old A3s because of the, the beautiful inlay on the peg head. And uh, I said, that's another mandolin I got from, from you, right? So, yep. That was a, a big, big gigantic mess when I got it. Somebody had stripped off a lot of the finish and it stuck another brace in it and it was just kind of a, kind of a, a wreck, but uh, it's a great sounding mandolin. That's an A3. And the white faced mandolin there is also an A3, uh, which were, this is the early color, the blonde or uh, pumpkin top and then it went to the white face. That's actually the first white faced instrument that I know of that was ever produced, uh, which uh, now you can see white face, just about white face anything, electric guitars especially. And stay on the guitar for, okay. for just a second. I thought you wanted to see it. Uh, but uh, we'll get to that one. <laughs> okay. But um, anyway, I, I would go down to Howard's and just stare through the window and think, boy, I would just love to have all those great old mandolins. And I don't know, it's a, been a, a lifelong dream to have a, a bunch of this cool old stuff and a, so actually playable and all that. <laughs> so. You've amassed a few here. So. Just a few, you know. Tim May and I did uh, this presentation basically on uh, on YouTube. You can go check it out. But uh, Tim asked uh, about an investment, what he, he thought I should he, he should do with uh, some money that he had. And he said, well, I can buy one lore mandolin or I can buy a whole mandolin orchestra full of stuff. And he went about doing that for about, uh, took about four years to put 12 pieces together that completely matched. And uh, that collection is now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in, uh, in New York City. So quite a collection, matching pieces, and you can go there and see that collection sometime. It's, it's very cool. And some of those, uh, some of those chapters on YouTube, tens of thousands of views, uh, on the mandocello, we do two mandocellos on that. Uh, Whiskey before breakfast. It's been viewed 163,000 times at the last time I took a look. I've only viewed it 160,000 yeah, so times. I don't so know how that happened. I know there's other people out there digging it. So, we'll do a we'll do a gospel tune right here, an old standard.
white base A3. Okay. And the bells. What do you want? Well, at the end of World War One, this fellow had uh, already signed up as an uh, acoustic engineer for Gibson. And um, he had to go do his duty in France. And by the time he got to the theater, it was basically the war was over and he did clerical duty and entertained troops. And um, he started doing a lot of research uh, about violin shops in Europe uh, because of they were in very close proximity where he was stationed in France. So I believe he started sending back uh, a lot of information and knowledge about uh, what he was amassing about violin technology. And uh, basically what Lloyd Lord did was uh, the final implementation of violin technology into the mandolins. Well, this is a, is a transitional piece from the, the standard F4. And this um, was the, the basically the, the transition from the old F4 to the F5. Has the truss rod with the first generation nickel truss rod cover. It's uh, a very on anything else at that point in time. The first 29th fret fingerboard, which came out completely over the sound hole on, on that side. And to get to that 29th fret, which was uh, that note right there, high C. Everybody uses that one all the time, by the way. Most popular so, note ever. That's actually a high A, I'm sorry. Uh, that, that tells there. you how much I played that note yeah. right there, that 29th fret. But uh, to play that 29th fret on the E, they lobbed off that, that point. And which would have taken a, an entirely different mold and uh, fixture to do that. But um, this, according to the Mandolin Archive, is the first Cremona sunburst mandolin. There was a mandola before it, but you can see the, uh, the quality of the work, wood and the workmanship is phenomenal. It's a very, very uh, that belonged to Julius uh, and or Albert Belson, who had the, the Gibson Pletcher Orchestra. And this is the mandolin in the uh, 1921 catalog that is uh, with the Plectro Orchestra, with Julius playing this particular mandolin in the 21 catalog. He was at 16 at that point in time, and um, it was quite the virtuoso from all, all accounts. I actually, when I first started at the custom shop, um, after we moved from the flood damage of the, at the mall, I was uh, had the honor of working with a fellow named uh, Dick Ickes, who started at Kalamazoo at the Gibson plant in Kalamazoo in 1963, and actually worked with Julius Belson. So it was a it was an honor to get to know him and and talk about Julius, and and uh, I ended up with this mandolin some years later. But uh, it's a it's a great little mandolin. It's it had the uh, first generation. Uh, adjustable height bridge, which actually originally has the um, the aluminum saddle. Uh, this is the later, the second generation uh, adjustable height bridge. And uh, I like the tone of this bridge a little bit more. It's not quite as bright, but has a lot of a lot of characters to an F5 in the F4. And then what what are you playing there? Um, you tell me. <laughs> I, I was talking to Dave, like, I, I admire these guys so much, and I call on David all the time. These guys have just been in it so long, you, you start to learn it through osmosis. I'm not there yet, but I am, this is a white this, top. This mandolin has eight strings. It, uh, <laughs> it has... Uh, the label says A5, A3. 9, A3. Okay. That's the later A3, it's 1920 A3. And these are both uh, very early lore period instruments. Uh, anything 19 forward. So this was um, much like the catalog description. These were originally built with birch back and sides, mahogany neck. And this one's actually, the catalog description has a maple back, pretty rare. And like I said, it's a, the first white top instruments that I'm aware of. So the difference in lore era between a Lloyd Lore signed and a lore era, the signed ones, did he actually work on? What makes those more valuable than a just lore era? Lore era instruments are 19, 19 to 1924. When he was head of the mandolin? He was and the he Dave was, Harvey of the time? Well, he was actually R&D. He was the head of uh, Artist Relations, the Warney Shop, and uh, evidently was 
was so highly regarded in the factory they referred to him as Master Lore. Now Master Model is a nod to that. And the Master Model did not come about till the 5 Series started. And those were F5 Mandolins, H5 Mandolas. So basically this version with a longer maple neck and the, uh, the F holes. And that's all the violin technology that, as I said, that he fi did the final implementation. A raised fingerboard, long maple neck, the truss rod so they could use a smaller neck. Uh, Laura was five feet four inches tall. Julius Belson, that played this male, owned this male, was five feet three. So smaller hands, they wanted smaller necks so that they could reach the upper positions and do it comfortably as well. So then the uh, H5 Mandola, the K5 Mandocello, which was the like the the guitar size version of the Mandocello over there, but uh, F holes as well. And then uh, uh, the of course the uh, let's see, I got lost track there a second. Uh, F5. H5 Mandola, K5 Mandocello, and that's uh, you know the the entire mandolin series, uh, and L5 guitar that was the other one. So the Mandocello, the K5 Mandocello was actually before the L5 guitar, and when those five series instruments came out, they were pretty pretty groundbreaking. If you think about the L5 guitar, <coughs> the L5 guitar. Uh, that later formed that sound of jazz and big band orchestras, that L5 guitar driving that orchestra, that was uh, Eddie Lang and Joe Venuti, that the big time session guys that played with all the session players in New York, uh, the Boswell sisters, the Dorseys, uh, Benny Goodman, that's that guitar that you hear, that's Eddie Lang on those early recordings. At the very same time, on the same instrument in 1928, Eddie Lang is inventing jazz, and over in Bristol, Tennessee, a little gal named Mother Maybelle Carter was inventing country music on the same instrument, on the L5 instrument. That's how important those instruments are. Uh, the F5 came out in 1923. The whole five series, very expensive. The F5 was 250 $290 with, uh, with the case, the, uh, the H5 uh, about $350, the, uh, the K5 Mandocello, there's 16 of those known. There are 24 of the H5 Mandolas known. There are about 320 of the F5s known and about two dozen of the L5 guitars, signed lore. And those can go anywhere from, oh, $75,000 to $175,000, depending on the instrument. But very highly regarded and I have very important. I in my house. I just want you all to know. What's your address? Where do you live? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anyway, that's, that's uh, a, a very important time that, that Lore started spearheading that whole five series instruments. And he was well ahead of his time. Uh, he basically came out with the F5 mandolin. It was so loud that the orchestra directors weren't really crazy about it because it was it was the doctors and the lawyers that could afford the loudest mandolin in an orchestra, not the best players. So they get in the orchestra and all of a sudden the directors are going, oh my gosh, this thing is blowing everything around it away. And that, so they implemented Beersy Tone Producers, kind of pulled it back, made everything blend a little better. And that's what we have over here, a Gibson, uh, Italian made violin from the the Virzi dad and uncle and the Virzi brothers violin over there made by the brothers that came up with the the Virzi tone which is a little baffle that is suspended from the top and kind of gives it this nice sweet sound but pulls the volume back right here right around the, your your uh, competition in the orchestra the next chair over that's going oh my gosh that mandolin is too loud so, you know, and that's something I just learned recently is, is that effect of how those instruments were, were viewed. So, you know, Bill Monroe comes along, he finds an F5, uh, July 9 F5, in a uh, barber shop in uh, Miami, Florida for $150 and buys this mandolin and, you know, immediately his style of playing completely changes to uh, reflect the mandolin. And you've got uh, bluegrass stomp and bluegrass breakdown and all that. So we uh, we celebrate Lore's 
uh, contributions to the mandolin. And actually, the F5 celebrates its anniversary in June of this year, 100 years old. So, you got very excited. A really cool poster of Lloyd Lore over here working on these mandolins. That's uh, Lloyd Lore at his R&D bench. He is holding the one and only Mando Viola that, w that came out in the middle of uh, 1923. And in front of him is a uh, couple of snakehead mandolins uh, in the white. One with the first generation adjustable bridge and the other one with the second generation adjustable bridge. So, and if you look close at that picture, you can see uh, trapdoor banjos, which that's what this mandolin banjo is, a trapdoor mandolin banjo. But there, there's a trapdoor that's hanging off, you can see it right there, but right behind him. And you can see his cigar boxes, which he was an avid cigar smoker. But you can also see Veerzy parts. Uh, Mando bass tuners on that bench. It's it's pretty amazing. And we do have some posters here for sale if uh, if y'all are interested in some of the Gibson posters, Jan's over there. Uh, he'll be glad to help you. Uh, some of the lore posters and uh, those are out of print. So uh, we're making a making a good deal uh, tonight on the posters. So if you're interested in any of those, just let us know as we go along here. But we'll um, we'll play a little tune here. <laughs> That one of the tunes from 1921, which is this mandolin right here, and uh, that mandolin in 1920, as Georgia Brown. You all know that tune? Basketball fan, anybody? So, yeah, this is going to be a G. A key of G. Yeah. Oh, this will be fun. Thank you. 
some amazing things right there. <laughs> your list and it just about freaked me out for two seconds. Okay. Well, that's the Django key. Right? <laughs> uh, okay. I like it in that key. Well, Who? I never heard of it. We are getting down <laughs> toward the last here. If uh, Does anybody have questions out there? We answer all the questions? Or? Well, I, I hope I'm not asking an embarrassing question. Uh, why did Lower leave Gibson or why did they part? Well, a couple of different reasons, I think, uh, from what from what I've read and seen. I think that um, that Lloyd Lohr, being a visionary, wanted to go into electric instruments in 1925. Wow. And I'm sure that the bean counters, being the bean counters, looked at the five series and said, uh, "Well, you you came up with this five series to try to spark up the reinterest in mandolin orchestras." And it's kind of a failure because if you've only sold less than 500 instruments at that point in time of the most expensive instruments that we were creating and the most labor intensive because they were oil varnish, French polish, you know, we didn't talk about all that. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> more expensive, you know, silver plate tuners. Kind and of ironic that, uh, you know, that wasn't well thought of then when now it's the gold standard. Exactly. Well, and, you know, Bill Monroe took him another 23 years to find a, an F5 in a barber shop. And, you know, if you look at it, the trends in music, that's what was driving it all. He was trying to bring back the, you know, the repopularity. And he was trying to get instruments that were louder. So that's where the trapdoor banjos came in. And that's where his, his push to create louder instruments. And so he basically invented not only the electric mandolin in 1924 by winding his, and installing his uh, pickup on his personal F5 that was still on the mandolin when that mandolin was discovered at, uh, at his widow's house, Bertha Lohr, uh, discovered by uh, Roger Semenoff. They got to be very good friends with Bertha Lohr. Roger started uh, bringing back the F5 and it's former glory, the F5L back in the 1980s, and did a tremendous job with, uh, with his work there and became very close with Bertha Lohr. When she went into her nursing home, the, the family came in, unfortunately, uh, threw a lot of Lloyd Lohr's personal items away. Threw away his uh, manuscripts, the handwritten manuscripts, that were there that that would Bertha would pull out and actually play for Roger. This is one that Lloyd wrote. So uh, she was in in a nursing home and uh, Roger was helping her with all all the her personal effects and in a hidden the old wedge shaped closet under a stairwell in the very back of this the the stairwell there was Lloyd Lore's mandolin. There was Lloyd Lohr's <clears throat> personal mando viola that he's pictured with, and that poster was in the case with his uh, stick viola that he invented. He invented the stick viola and the stick bass with pickups in 1925 as well, and 24 actually. So here is Lohr, Lloyd Lohr inventing electric instruments, and he's trying to get Gibson to back that, and they, didn't, they chose not to. And that was basically, he decided to strike out on his own with uh, several of Gibson's top executives. And they, they were going to do electric instruments under the Vivitone name. And there are some Vivitone instruments out there. Uh, but 
what happened is the depression and it basically uh, uh, basically ended that company because they couldn't number one they couldn't get financing they couldn't get the parts that they needed because of the depression and uh, just you know four years after uh, Lloyd Laura left Gibson that was pretty much uh, that was pretty much the end of his career as a an instrument manufacturer and he went back to Oberlin College and taught acoustic engineering for the rest of his life. Well, that was the next question. I, I remember that title, acoustic engineer, and didn't he have that title for a while or something at Gibson too? That was his title at, yeah. at Gibson. He was uh, the very first acoustic engineer to sign the signature labels that you see in all the five series instruments. So that is the coveted $100,000 signature on, the, on all those. So. Uh, that is, uh, any other questions? I'm sorry. Can you speak about the Mersey and Hawk? Some, I've heard that it's, you know, it's been removed out of Manland. Hawk come off? Interesting you should bring that up, because we're, that's where we're going next. I don't want to show the trapdoor on this. I got I, a lot of people ask about what is a trapdoor banjo, trapdoor uh, deal, and this is actually, this is an example of it. It actually has a door that opens up in the back to create sound to come out of the back of the instrument instead of a resonator that just goes around. So opens it up, makes it bigger, louder, and more open. Demonstrate it with, uh, with both the trap door closed and open. This little banjo's got that volume yeah. then. And then you open it up. You can hear the big difference. And then. Weren't some players actually learned how to use it to go almost like a wah-wah type of effect? I'm not sure that that's, that was really, they meant to do that. Okay, but, maybe uh, it was just an accident. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it was an accident. I'm not sure that, about the, that technology, but it was a, you know, mandolin orchestras got to the end of their popularity. Banjo orchestras came along for about five minutes. And um, thank God. And I, I, I actually got this mandolin Hello, banjo. Baby. Hello, mommy. Yeah, exactly. So I got this mandolin banjo at George Gruen's yard sale. He had a yard sale there in Nashville. And I got this in a trapdoor TB5 tenor banjo. And I took this, and I was so excited about this because I mean, it's, it's intact, it's Cremona uh, sunburst finish. And silver parts, the tuners are very much like a lore uh, era F5, except they're A model tuners. I actually could sell the tuners off this piece for more than I gave for the banjo. Uh, anyway, I took this home and I was playing it and sitting in my, my lounge chair and Jan comes in and says, ah, that sounds pretty good if you were walking down the driveway. <laughs> And, uh, and my daughter comes in and she, she gives me this look like of disdain. I'm playing the banjo. I finally, in the first time in my life, knew what a banjo player went through his, for his entire career. So I'm playing the man, this mandolin banjo. And next night I come in and I sit down and pull out the mandolin banjo. And I hear my daughter hit the door and she comes in and she, she looks at Jane. And she says, Mom, he's doing it again. <laughs> so no respect as a banjo player. And... Uh, it just lives in the case mostly <laughs> now, and, and again, oh, thank God. Yeah, nice. <laughs> this is a this is a cool little item. It's an aftermarket pick holder and a little ivory pick to go there and to go with that whole setup. But uh, it's a, it's a piece of history, and, and I I kind of like pulling it out, and uh, I could take it off my taxes that way. So mm -hmm. anyway, back to the Veerzy, and we talked about the Veerzy violin over here and the Veerzy brothers. Um, they're Basically what they did, they invented a baffle that would spin from the underside of the top and kind of give the, the instruments this nice sweet sound. Let me trade with you here. Uh, we'll take the, the A4, Veerzy A4, and the was a Veerzy F4 and now it's knocked out unfortunately. <laughs> See them on the inside if you ever see one. There's like a little disc on the inside that's suspended. Yeah, if you if you look through the sound hole here, and it actually has a Veerzy label as well, and and the it's um, it says Veerzy in uh, quotation marks, Veerzy tone, and it gives a number. This one's uh, one zero five seven eight, and it says U.S. and foreign patents, New York. 
and it has their little Veerzy symbol. And then the Veerzy actually uh, is stamped on the on the Veerzy tone producer itself. Now, I got this one very recently, and I, I've, I've been wanting a, a good Veerzy man on for a while. I got this one before this one, and because it had the Veerzy label on it, I was so excited, and it came and somebody had removed the Veerzy. Uh, the, the bluegrass guys call them Veerzy tone reducers. Yes. Yeah. And it's because it takes a kind of a sophisticated ear to hear away from the instrument and it projects farther and that's basically what the Veerzy was about, was making the sound of the instrument project to the back of the hall. And uh, I also, I think that the orchestra directors like that again because it calmed the volume down, on especially the 5 Series. Now I think the Veerzy sounds... <laughs> has a wonderful sound up close. This also, by the way, is an example. People talk about snakehead uh, mandolins. That is a snakehead mandolin right there. Yep. Uh, so. With the classic Fleur de Lis and the Gibson. And this is 1924, lower period. Uh, in the 1924 catalog, when they're they're touting the uh, advantages of the Veerzy tone producer. It's an A4 with the back off that you can see the Veerzy, how it's installed and the mandolin. So that this is the catalog, basically like the catalog mandolin. Uh, this has the air point tuners with the chocolate buttons, chocolate buttons on the F4 with the bump in tuners. And for all of you, the mandolin geeks out there, they um, immediately know all that crazy, crazy stuff. Let's hear how that one sounds. That's very warm, very... This is kind of a survivor mandolin too. I li literally have not done anything to this mandolin yet. Could use a little setup or... I haven't even changed strings on this melon. It almost has like a reverb effect that the Veerzy does. So You're um, asking how people got them out of there. What uh, Everybody I know, it was usually not a good way to do it. They would take a screwdriver and a little hammer and knock them out of there. And that's literally how they would They were just them suspended by a couple little pieces of wood that right. were glued to the top and three, three little feet and they bust them out of there. And you can see this if you look through the antenna, you can see the, the evidence of the Veerzy feet still in that mantle. Well, Randy Wood took mine out. So he took the back off of it to do it? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Was that the Toro? Yeah. Uh, Larry Sledge, everybody. Uh, he He's actually... Uh, the former over a, a owner of a very famous lore era instrument that's uh, the the Toro HF Toro lore uh, that has the uh, the rhinestones in the peg head factory installed and uh, I think a, an L5 has surfaced uh, recently that has the same configuration of the the rhinestones in the peg head HF Toro was uh, like the Liberace of mandolins and uh, yeah, they, it wasn't fancy enough with all those scrolls and points and stuff. It had to shine off the stage and yeah. the lights. Had to. Had By to the way, I, I, I tried to get Gibson to build me a guitar that did that, and they wouldn't do it, so uh, it kind of bummed me out a little bit. I needed rhinestones all over it. Can you work on that? Uh, we did one for Dolly. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> me and Dolly then. If there we, we start go. looking as good as her. <laughs> Somewhere about that. How many uh, versions were in those? I mean, that is a, that is a good question. I don't know the exact number. I know that there, uh, especially in '24, uh, that there are quite a few Veerzy's in '24. But I know that that H5 Mandola had a Veerzy, and that was the first one I got to see. And it was, I put a mirror down in there and looking at it. It wasn't just like a little plate, but it almost had little F holes carved into it, and yeah, it was it was an engineering see, feat. It is an engineering feat. And if you actually look at this one, you can kind of see the the little S hole sort of in the, in the instrument. So, when I was at the factory back in the '60s, they had a couple of mandolins on display that were very ornate and uh, almost covered with mother of pearl. Do those still exist? 
I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, you know, the, a lot of that stuff goes, you know, we've had a, flyer, a fire and a flood. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that stuff goes away uh, in a, over time. And then, you know, some of the, the coveted older employees, sometimes they that ends up at their house. Yeah. So they put their time in. Any other questions? Well, the lore is a is a Asian knockoff, brand. and it's a it's a brand unto itself. And I won't I won't approach that subject <laughs> at this point in time. It's a it's a sore spot with me, but um, you know, and I understand it. It's uh, it's Asian names trying to cop into American like the Kentucky, the lore, the you know Savannah, and, and all that. So it's it's a marketing thing with the, with Asian instruments. But the Gibson, I think, is, is from that Gilded Age. It's, uh, if it was really special, it was the something. It was a, you know, it was the Ford. It wasn't just a Ford, it was, you know, it was, it was a special thing. And I, that's the only reason that I can think of that they started using. And then they, you know, basically in the 1930s, it, it, it became a little passe, and they just went to Gibson, and, uh, and that, you know, so when they resurrected the Gibson logo, I, I remember very clearly seeing it again at Howard's Music, um, a mandolins from that period that had the Gibson on it. I went, uh, told a, uh, a friend of mine, Neil Allen, uh, one of the Allen brothers. I said, "Man, they've got a they got a, a brand new Gibson mandolin with the Gibson on it." You know, so he rushed right down and bought one. And uh, that was a that was a pretty big deal at the time because, you know, what you're seeing, like these three <clears throat> mandolins right here, well, four mandolins. You see the '30s logo from 1937 to about 41, mid '30s to 41, and then you see the late '40s Gibson style in the in the F5, the blonde F5, and the EM200 electric mandolin, and the A5 Florentine. They all have that uh, that later block inlays. Careful. It's okay, you can fix it. That's what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see the difference there in that in that block and lay. But it, it's got a cool thing itself. But that's a, in that same time period where I'm sure the guys building all the other guitars and it was like, well, we don't need those fancy inlays. We just it's the same logo as a Les Paul. So they just started using all that on the same instruments. But uh, that's as far as I know, that's. I hope that helps. I didn't really answer the question, but uh, as far as I know, that's as close I as heard, I can get. I heard one description of um, uh, Stradivarius means um, the Stradivari or something like that, like the best, and, and that the Gibson was kind of a play off of Stradivarius. So. I like that. We'll go with that. Well, the violin. It's always a parallel with violin technology, with Gibson instruments, early on at least it was. Good question. Very good. Anybody else? All right. Let's pick one. Okay. Do you want to talk at all about that? Or are we getting to that one later? Uh, one set of... Let's pick one first. Okay. And we'll, then we'll talk about that. You want to do all of me? Sure, I guess. I play mandolin or play guitar. You want me to put those back? I got them. I can do it. Yeah. Boom. Bam. What are you doing that in? Well, I heard these guys on one of their videos do this too. Many <laughs> we learned it five minutes before the video. Be fun. <laughs> I don't know if I remember. I don't know either. the key on this. And, uh, Jeremy said it was the first time he ever played it, so it's going to If I watched that video, I didn't have a beer, so that was shot like six months ago, so I, this will be my first time playing it again. All right. I don't know if I can remember it. No, right, guts, try. no guts, no glory. Yeah. Yeah. Me? Yep. Thank you. 
Something like that. cool story about one of these instruments and um, it's, it's not often that you find a find an instrument from the original family and uh, or the second family or the third or fourth or fifth even but uh, this is a this is a pretty special mandolin right here um, I was contacted by the the original family that owns this uh, that owned it uh, and it's uh, it had been in their family since 1930 uh, they found it in a music store near Kalamazoo, about 60 miles from Kalamazoo. And uh, they sent me pictures and I'd never seen anything quite like it. I've seen the, the perloid head veneer and fingerboard on banjos and some of the ukuleles and this is a poinsettia, uh, basically engraved and inked. So you can see the, the engraving and then the, uh, the perloid fingerboard. And about two weeks after I saw the, the pictures of this, and they're saying, well, what is it? What is, what's it worth? It's like, well, there's no precedent because, you know, it can, it can be rare, but if it's not desirable, that's, uh, there's no precedent for what the money is. And I, I was trying to think about, well, what, what is it really worth? Because I'd never, and I started doing research and see if I could find anything quite like it. And then lo and behold, on, on Facebook, our friends, the the Facebook, the Facebook people. Are they your friends? Yeah. I, I, well, I, don't I mean, know how many people's know. friends they are, but I have friends on Facebook. Oh, I'll there you go. So somebody posted on uh, the vintage uh, Gibson Archtop guitar site on Facebook uh, an L5 that had exactly that fingerboard and that peg head veneer, and uh, the L5, lo and behold, had belonged to Smiley Burnett, the singing cowboy star from the movies. And it, it was exactly that, I mean, very, very close. You can tell it's hand done. It's not a machine. It's a guy that's sitting there engraving that piece of perloid. And it was uh, very much like this mandolin. So I started looking around and I thought, well, wow, I wonder if it's in one of his movies. So I started looking through all the, the old movies on, uh, on YouTube and came across Smiley Burnett singing, Mama Don't Lau No Guitar Picking Around Here. So he starts out, and he's playing, he's playing, I think, like harmonica. And then he puts the harmonica down and reaches around behind him as guitar player, and there it is, there's the L5 with the same configuration. So I'm thinking, I, I was getting all excited. Is the mandolin next, you know? So he, uh, he puts, he gives the guitar back, reaches down and picks up a snake head mandolin, and not this one at all, but Right behind him is the plectrum banjo player that's playing a plectrum banjo, just like this as well. And I'm thinking, wow, I wonder if that was a set. And it was 1930, so he couldn't really afford to plop down $200 for this mandolin. And it ended up at a music store in Kalamazoo. Now, I have no way to confirm that. 
but the family that bought it bought it in 1930. They also bought uh, a triple O 18 Martin guitar and a brand new fiddle. So the uh, and it was still in the same family. And getting to know the the uh, the grandson of the fellow that bought it. The fellow that bought it was uh, was named uh, Gene Quick, and everybody called him Daddy Gene. So I started seeing some of the pictures of him playing this mandolin from back in the day and I thought well that's that's really cool I don't know what to you know what range but I could tell it needed a lot of work the neck was out of it the it had some pretty bad cracks uh, that had been repaired poorly on this side this crack was open and it needed refretting pretty badly when I got it and this scroll had been busted off and repaired badly uh, so I gave them a range. I said, well, if you're interested, I know it needs a lot of work, so here's the range. And then two weeks later, he got back with me. The grandson, Robin Marsh, got back with me at, and said his mother, Eugenia Marsh, would like me to have the mandolin. And uh, I said, well, how much? And, of course, it was my my top end of the range. <laughs> That's the way that works, you know. <laughs> so, And I thought, well, you know, I I gave her I gave her the range so uh, I said well I've got another mandolin I've got to sell if I sell it I'm I'll buy it and sure enough it, it gets gets to my house and it was like it's just so cool because you I've got pictures dating back to very early on from the one family it belonged to and uh, so now the mandolin is daddy quick and uh, that's that's this mandolin and and just so uh, appreciate it so much that I know the history. The family had a, a very interesting history. They, uh, the, the the grandfather, actually his dad actually built the very first airplane that flew in the state of Georgia in about 1905, and they only missed beating the uh, Wright brothers by about two years because they they couldn't get an engine for their airplane, and their airplane looked exactly like the uh, the Da Vinci airplane, if you've ever seen that, a monoplane in 1905, well before monoplanes existed, a oh, single wing plane in other words. So the, uh, the family obviously had some means because they were able to buy instruments during the depression and then the, uh, the inventor of that airplane went, to work, uh, went on to work for NASA. So interesting family and uh, interesting history and a, and a mandolin that still survives. It was missing both these points when I, when I got it. These little point protectors had fallen off and uh, I replaced those as well. So, you I'm know. also excited that I'm going to be the third owner of this one too. So. <laughs> I'm scoring tonight. You hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> This one's uh, close to 1930. I figured, well, let's play a little bluegrass maybe on this on this piece.
you all very much. Thank you for coming out. Thanks uh, to all the Chapman fellows for having me here tonight, and I uh, really appreciate it. If you get a chance and you're interested in the uh, and some of the posters, we're we're making a two for one deal on those tonight. Um, or you can get one for twenty five, two for forty, I think it is, and uh, three for ninety five. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so I, did, thank you uh, I want to thank I, I do want to thank David Harvey and and Jan as well because trust me, there's no way David got here and Jan not brought him here. So that's right. <laughs> um, but I also want to thank them, uh, the Gibson uh, folks. We did finally get some more mandolins in. We've got five fresh ones. We talked about the evolution of mandolins. David is now running a amazing shop some of the best mandolins gibson has put out and uh Thank we you. are genuinely really proud of every one of them that has, that has come in so right now we have three f9s that just came in today mm -hmm. and a f5 fern f5 g and a fern f5 g and a fern that is right so uh we got those just came in you'll be looking for those on the website hopefully very soon and again, thank you all. Thank David and for coming on out here. Thank you, Dad. Thank you all very much. Thank you.